it's a new era in CFB to start off this year, put on full display. My take on this game is simple. I, I know some people will be upset about it. Good riddance to the Pac-12. Can you do it in terms of the week to week to week? I don't see a pathway for this team to miss the college football playoffs. We want to make sure you have those best bets in the entirety of our betting cards. That was Tony Gwynn! But he had that he program! Was was going going there. There. Only on Sports Grid. Guardians, despite being at home in the land, were a home underdog against Derek Skubal. Enter Lane Thomas. Maybe one of the under-the-radar trade deadline acquisitions being dealt from the Nationals. He was huge in the ALDS. A heavy favorite for the New York Yankees in the series. You're going to look to their best two ball players to be those MVPs. That's Juan Soto and it's Aaron Judge. The early line. Only on Sports Grid. Right here with you on Pro Football Today on Sports Grid. Odds in motion, trying to see what lines have moved throughout the week. Never felt more comfortable in the set than I do for this year. I am uh, ready. I'm just getting angry. The hot takes are going to be here all uh, long. What in the world is going on in Miami, Dom? It's not particularly anything to shy away from just because many people are on top of it. Hot take, hot take. I think this line is asking you once again to take the wounds. Pro Football Today, only on Sports Grid. Good morning. Welcome to Newswire here on Sports Grid. I'm Craig Mish. Wild night in the NFL. Two games on Monday Night Football. We'll recap them for you. Also, Matthew Waters is with us from Legal Sports Report as FanDuel takes over Bally Sports, courtesy of Diamond Sports. We'll talk about how those new regionals potentially affect your viewing. In addition, Bill Bender joins us for the latest in college football and also Dexter Henry is in the house. It's opening night in the National Basketball Association. A couple of games to review as the NBA champion Boston Celtics are back on the court tonight. But first and foremost, let's get to those games in the NFL last night. Good news for the Ravens, bad news for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Tale of two teams, without a doubt, Ravens are playing fantastic football right now. Lamar Jackson was incredible last night for the Ravens. He ends up throwing five touchdown passes, 41-31 to 31 the final score. Derrick Henry also with a big game there. Baker Mayfield threw for three touchdowns in defeat. Tampa Bay actually had a 10 to nothing lead in this game, but the issue for the Buccaneers coming out of this game is pretty serious. We'll get to that in just a minute. But first, let's hear from Lamar Jackson on another MVP-like performance going on the road to Tampa Bay and coming back to win. Let's go. Like, you know, we got to score points. We, uh, to us, like, we see a team just moving the ball and uh, putting points on the board without us scoring. Uh, we didn't. We didn't really do anything. Our drive, the first drive, it's like, man, we gotta have some urgency with ourselves, and that's what it was. And that, I believe that's what we did. The next couple drives, we started putting points on the board. Those guys were still getting after us a little bit, but you know, we was, came out on top. Our mind is just focus on the drive, focus on the play, um, and just go from there. Try to put points on the board, but we don't really look at it like we or we clicking and you know, we got them. Like it's like we gotta score each and every time we out there. Nah. I'm chasing something right now, so each and every game is going to be the same thing for me. Like, I'm going to be the same person. Every game I'm trying to win. I don't even worry about the old year, like years prior. You know, I'm focused on right now, and us just being 5-2 and two, don't really matter. We're just trying to be 1-0 each and every week we out there on that field. Ravens playing great football at the moment. Buccaneers have been playing really good offensive football for the entire season. Maybe that will change now. A couple of key injuries coming out of last night's game. With Tampa Bay, it's being reported this morning that Chris Godwin, their great slot wide receiver, is going to miss the remainder of the season with a dislocated ankle. He's going to have surgery. 
and will return for the 2025 NFL season, although he is a free agent. Also, Mike Evans, the future Hall of Fame wide receiver who caught his 100th touchdown yesterday, also left the game and is undergoing an MRI. There's a chance the Bucs will not have either of those two wide receivers, at least for the near future. We will see. All right, uh, Chargers took on the Cardinals last night. In case you missed this game, it was on ESPN+. Plus. Not sure how that worked out, but either way, uh, kind of a dull one, but the Cardinals end up winning final 17 to 15. Kyler Murray with a couple of touchdowns, one rushing, one passing, and it wasn't for a lack of moving the ball on the Chargers side. In fact, if you look statistically at the Chargers, looked like they had a pretty decent game. They just fumbled near the uh, goal line and also were just kicking a bunch of field goals. And Jim Harbaugh, after the game, head coach of the Chargers, essentially said the reason why they didn't win was executing in the red zone. Uh, you know, six, uh, eight drives, um, you know, six of them were, well, five, five were scoring drives and, and one should have been, you know, we, we fumbled at the inside the five yard line there, but, uh, thought the, thought we moved the ball, uh, very effectively through the air. Um, you know, kept waiting for the, the running game to pop, but we, we, uh, you know, we weren't able to, you know, there's the details, you know, of, of locking it up, you know, um, whether you're an offensive player or a defensive player, and you just got to continue to uh, to emphasize it. And you know, the the fumble near the goal line, you know, gosh, ball ball needs to be in the other arm, and and uh, you know can't can't lighten up. So that's what we're going to do: just not lighten up, tighten up, um, and you know, uh, experience of these kind of games. I mean, um, you know, put the steel in the spine. That's uh, that's what we need to do. Chargers didn't score in the red zone. That led to the Cardinals win. Meanwhile, the Arizona Cardinals will be on the road this week, taking on the Miami Dolphins. Their defense, it looks like, will face off with quarterback Tua Tungavailoa. The Dolphins yesterday said that he is indeed practicing and has full plans to play this week if he is cleared from concussion protocol. Some of the surrounding discussion was whether or not Tua should come back. Will he come back? Will he wear a guardian cap, which is supposedly uh, more protective on concussions? Tua pretty defiant yesterday in the media, saying that he's ready to come back and just has to be a little more careful. It's got to be smart. That's it. It's got to be smart. My my entire time playing football, I've been a competitor, and that, you know, is or was sort of my edge. When I would run from high school, even in college, I would do the same thing. Uh, but it's a professional, you know, setting. This is the professional level, the best of the best. You know, you just can't be doing that. So uh, definitely got to gotta stay more available for, for, the, for the team, for the organization, for our guys. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated, but th- this, is, this is what it is. You know, I'd, do I want to be, you know, known for this? No, I don't, but that's that's the cards I've been dealt with given the history of it. So it is what it is. What have you learned like throughout this, this process? Throughout this process, excuse me. That it's not good to get concussions? Fair enough from Tua. He'll play this week, it looks like, against the Cardinals. Meanwhile, let's get to some sports betting news before we get to Matthew Waters. There's a lawsuit that's been filed last week against underdog fantasy prize picks and Yahoo Fantasy Sports alleging that the companies are operating not only as daily fantasy sports platforms, but also offering and accepting illegal sports bets. It's a little complicated because they're claiming that there's more than $10 million per month from prop and pick em bets, where essentially what FanDuel and DraftKings are offering as well. Underdog Fantasy has dismissed the claim, saying it's a completely transparent uh, phishing attempt by a plaintiff that will get dismissed sooner than later. That's what they told front office sports. We will see how this is handled in the state of Massachusetts. All right, back to the National Football League. It appears Jaden Daniels could potentially miss the showdown with Caleb Williams this week. Washington takes on Chicago. He's suffering with a rib injury, and they're saying that it's currently week to week. Brandon Ayuk, the wide receiver on the San Francisco 49ers, has a torn ACL and MCL and is going to miss the remainder of the season. The 49ers already playing without Christian McCaffrey and already playing without Debo Samuel, who has pneumonia, could miss time too. Uh, 49ers need some pass catchers going into their games the next couple of weeks. Jamison Williams, who was suspended 
for uh, sports wagering a year ago has now looks like he's facing a potential two game suspension for violating the PED policy in the National Football League, although nothing official has been said just yet. And also DK Metcalf, great wide receiver on the Seattle Seahawks week to week with an MCL sprain. There's a possibility he could play this week. The Kansas City Chiefs have lost uh, another player to injury. Wide receiver Juju Smith-Schuster, also cornerback Jalen Watson, are both going to be out this week. Although the New Orleans Saints are playing without all their wide receivers, Raheed Shaheed, Chris Olave. They have signed former Chief Marquez Valdez-Scantling. They're also playing without their starting quarterback. And also Desmond Ritter has been signed by the Raiders off the Cardinals practice squad. Ritter could play this week. Gardner Minshew is the starter. Aiden O'Connell is going to miss some time. Oklahoma Sooners have had a tough year, offensively especially, and so they're turning back to another quarterback. This time it is Jackson Arnold. He will start this week against number 18 Ole Miss. Uh, it, it has been a roller coaster of quarterbacks for Oklahoma this season, some winning and some losing, and they're ready to make a change. Also, Michigan has not named their starting quarterback. Jack Tuttle replaced Alex Orgy early October, still trying to decide what they're going to do. They don't, basically are having a hard time scoring. Tonight in college football, Sam Houston State is five and a half point f- uh, favorites on the road against FIU. Louisiana Tech home favorites of six and a half against UTEP. And also news yesterday from the WNBA as the players have opted out of their current collective bargaining agreement and they could even face a work stoppage if they don't get a new deal by the 2025 season. We'll be back with more college football talk with Bill Bender next. Despite being at home in the land, we're a home underdog against Tarek Skubal. Enter Lane Thomas, maybe one of the under-the-radar trade deadline acquisitions being dealt from the Nationals. He was huge in the ALDS. A heavy favorite for the New York Yankees in the series. You're going to look to their best two ball players to be those MVPs. That's Juan Soto and it's Aaron Judge. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Right here with you on Pro Football Today on Sports Grid. Odds in motion, trying to see what lines have moved throughout the week. Never felt more comfortable in the set than I do for this year. I am uh, ready. I'm just getting angry. The hot takes are going to be here all uh, long, people. What in the world is going on in Miami, Doc? It's not particularly anything to shy away from just because many people are on top of it. Hot takes, hot takes. I think this line is asking you once again to take the world. Pro Football Today, only on Sports Grid. in a whole new world of college football with the college football playoff expanding to 12 teams. And, and I think the, the new world also includes not having a bleeping clue <laughs> as to who is going to win the championship this year. I mean, it is crazy. Let's bring in Bill Bender from Sporting News. And, you know, Bill, even if we had the traditional four teams fighting it out in the college football playoff, I don't think that anybody really knows right now who the best team in the country is. I mean, you can have rankings. You can say that you think you know. But at this point, it's about as wide open as I've seen. 
Yeah, forget about the national championship. I can't figure out the SEC. There's nine teams with two losses or less. Uh, nine teams that are ranked between Texas to Vanderbilt. It's been wild. The Big Ten, same deal. I mean, who do you think is the best team in the Big Ten right now? On paper, it's Oregon. Yeah, they beat Ohio State. They, they probably have the best shot of any of these top five teams to go undefeated into the college football playoff championship games or the conference championship games. But who knows from there? And Georgia, Texas was yet another reminder that I don't know how to pick a top five game. I should have, I was on Texas last week. Georgia proved that wrong in a hurry. Yeah, no, I mean, these games have, have certainly been crazy. And, and by the way, a lot of the games too, like over before they begin. And then all of a sudden, like late in the game, you're like, wait, maybe there's a shot here. Uh, but Oregon is the number one team in the country. And by virtue of the quarterback on Ohio State, not really knowing how much time was left. I mean, think about that for a minute. You probably could also same thing, uh, say the same thing about Georgia. They had one bad half all season against Alabama. Since then, they've been really good. They get that win against Texas. I find it very interesting, Bill, that Kirby Smart is playing this underdog card, I guess. You, nobody wants to believe in us kind of stuff. I'm like reading all this stuff saying, wait a second here. Like, you guys are always good. <laughs> There's no underdog card here with Georgia. And they're one of those teams, Bill, that's going to be playing in the playoff. I guess the question in your mind is, do you, do, were you impressed enough with that win over Georgia to think that they should be, let's say, one of the main contenders to win the championship. Yes, and because of the defense. That was angry, Georgia. You know, allowing 1.1 yards per carry to uh, a really good Texas team that had dominated everybody up to that point. You mentioned it. Kirby plays the underdog card better than anybody. He plays it when they're 30-point favorites. He plays it when they're a rare underdog, but it worked, and they played well. most impressive part of that game was after the pass interference debacle, where the fans were throwing things on the field. They reversed the call. Texas scores. What does Georgia do? They take the ball down the field, 11 plays, 80 yards, touchdown, game over. That's national championship DNA. They still have it. Don't love their running game. I still think that there, there's some work to be done there. But this Georgia team is good enough to win a national title. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, all right, so Alabama in a very rare situation in the history of college football, going back, let's say, 20 years, two losses. We haven't even got to November. Uh, I mean, they're on the outside looking into this thing. But again, you know, SEC championship, end of the season. They've done this before, and they find their way back in. Tennessee, on the other hand, did exactly what they were supposed to do and take care of the Crimson Tide. And I think finally, Bill, it's fair to say that Tennessee is right smack in the middle of this championship picture. They needed that win. It's huge. Huge for Tennessee. They're doing it differently. You know, Josh Heupel has this reputation as an offense guy and, and getting the ball up and down the field. Their defense is good. It's really good. Nico's getting better with each, each week. Iamaliava gets the late touchdown pass. In the past, when Alabama takes that 17-14 lead on the rushing touchdown, Tennessee folds there in the past. They answered. They scored 10 points. I think with Alabama, what I'm looking at is a different problem each week. Against Vandy, couldn't get off on the field on third down. Against South Carolina, situational football at the end of each half. Against Tennessee, couldn't stay on the field on third down. And right. Jalen Milrow had a bad turnover. So, I don't know, Craig. Do you really think they can go to Tiger Stadium and beat LSU on the road the way they're playing right now? I'm not sure they can. Yeah, I, I mean, especially is it Saturday night? Uh, I don't know. Because Saturday night, no one wins at LSU. <laughs> Through the years, right. that's the way it's gone in Death Valley. Uh, okay, so look, surprise of the season is you know, there's a, a couple surprises. The academies both being ranked, I think that's a big one. This is probably the biggest though. The fact that Indiana is seven and zero on the season, seven wins, no losses. They're doing it in blowout fashion. No one had this at the beginning of the year, and you know, look, being undefeated definitely gives them a shot at the college football playoff. But what's really interesting, Bill and we'll look at the odds to make the playoff too, is that the odds makers are still sort of telling us is a little bit of a paper tiger here. They're still two to one to make the college football playoff being seven and oh, I mean, there's only a handful of games left for this team too. How have they you know, turned this around so quickly? How, how has that school gotten so good this year? Kurt Signetti is probably the big 10 version of Steve Spurrier. He brings in 13 transfers from James Madison. They bring in Curtis Rourke, the Ohio transfer quarterback, who is going to sit this week. That's probably why those odds are the way they are. He's an NFL quarterback. His brother played with Jacksonville. He's been outstanding. Throws the ball down the field well. They run the ball with effectively. If they had a different uniform on, 
you, you'd think you were looking at Michigan or Penn State. They're playing mm-hmm. with that kind of style. That was an eye-opening blowout against Nebraska. I thought that game was going to be close. It was 28-7 at halftime. The big thing with Indiana moving forward is they have to take care of business against Washington this week, against a Huskies team that can move the football without Rourke. Taven Jackson's up at quarterback, and they'll be judged on the Michigan and Ohio State games. But, Craig, there is a scenario. I painted it out this morning. Get this. Imagine Oregon, Penn State, Ohio State, Illinois, Indiana. There is a scenario where all five teams could be 11-1 and one and 8-1 and one in conference play. It requires Illinois upsetting Oregon, but the fact we're talking about it says how wild this could be. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy that the Big Ten, SEC, both conferences are having a great year uh, real quick, Indiana plus uh, 200 to get in. Kansas State with a big statement. Uh, they're plus 165 to make the college football playoff. A- anything you like there in particular? I-, I can't give you LSU because that's even money. you got to pick something else. Give me the Wildcats. I still think they're the best team in the Big 12. They've gotten through all the tough road games. They play Iowa State at the end of the year. They run the ball. They stop the run. Avery Johnson's gotten better. I'm still on Kansas State as the Big 12 champion. And they impress every week. All right, Bill, great stuff. We'll catch up later in the week. Thanks again for coming on Newswire. Hey, thank you. All right, coming up next, we're going to preview one of the Academy's big game this week. How about this? Notre Dame with a chance to win, but, you know, playing a team in the Academy and where they're not a 30-point favorite, look out. We'll have a preview next. Don't go away. Despite being at home in the land, we're a home underdog against Tarek Skubal. Enter Lane Thomas. Maybe one of the -the under-the-radar trade deadline acquisitions being dealt from the Nationals. He was huge in the ALDS. A heavy favorite for the New York Yankees in the series. You're going to look to their best two ball players to be those MVPs. That's Juan Soto and it's Aaron Judge. The early line. Only on SportsGrid. Right here with you on Pro Football Today on Sports Grid. Odds in motion, trying to see what lines have moved throughout the week. Never felt more comfortable in the set than I do for this year. I'm uh, ready. I'm just getting angry. The hot takes are going to be here all uh, long. People. What in the world is going on in Miami, Doc? It's not particularly anything to shy away from just because many people are on top of it. Hot takes, hot takes. I think this line is asking you once again to take the wounds. Pro Football Today, only on Sports Grid. Welcome back to Newswire here on Sports Grid. We'll preview a game in the top 25 this week. Also talk some Boston Celtics basketball. They get ready to go tonight. A little Dallas Cowboys football, too. It's time now for the Sports Grid Sound Off. Okay, so historically speaking, uh, it happens every year. Notre Dame, they always play the military academies, most of them. Uh, usually they play Navy around this time of the year. Maybe it's in November. 
And folks, all I got to do is think back the last 10 years. How many times has Notre Dame played Navy where they have been, at minimum, a three-touchdown favorite going into the game? Well, folks, that ain't the case this year. Navy's a really good team. They're ranked in the top 25, and the spread is about 12. So does Navy stand a chance to upset Notre Dame in this premier matchup this week in college football? Let's check in with Ben Stevens. He has a preview. A storied rivalry in college football, but in 2024, it feels just a little bit different. It's the 97th all-time game between Notre Dame and Navy on Saturday afternoon in East Rutherford, New Jersey, inside MetLife Stadium. But this year, it's a top 25 tilt. Number 12, Notre Dame, a 12 and a half point favorite against 24th ranked Navy, the midshipman, perfect six and O for the first time since 1979. And Navy is an offensive juggernaut, the fourth best scoring offense in the country who has played to the over in all six of its games this year. The only college football program that can claim that Notre Dame has covered in every game against non-MAC opponents. Navy is covered in every game against FBS foes. It should be a great Saturday between Notre Dame and Navy in New Jersey. Craig, back to you. Thanks very much, Ben. And also for the first time in a long time, it's possible that that Army-Navy game that's coming up in December has even a bigger meaning than it normally has, which is arguably one of the best and uh, most exciting college football games of the year where they play by themselves on one Saturday, Army-Navy. But this year, both could be ranked in the top 25. Okay, the NBA is back tonight. The Boston Celtics coming off a championship are going to raise the banner. It should be a fun night. And by the way, they get the marquee game tonight in the NBA as well against the New York Knicks. Joe Mazzula was asked uh, about, you know, sort of moving forward and putting the past behind. I did not expect this response to that question. Zero, no pressure. Uh, we're all going to be dead soon, and it really doesn't matter anymore. So uh, there's zero pressure. You're either going to win or you're not. And when you win, you try to forget about it a week later. And when you lose, you try to forget about it a week later. And so it's not pressure, it's an opportunity. And I, I, we have an opportunity here. Uh, over the next few years, however long we're together, we've said this in the past, like we have an opportunity to carry the organization forward, to double down on the tradition and the history of what this organization has. And what else would you expect than someone expecting you to win all the time? I, I wouldn't want someone expecting me to lose all the time. That would be debilitating. Uh, so we have an expectation to win. We have great character, great talent. And, you know, we just have to work to maximize that. And we're going to rely on the players to do that. Yeah, Dexter Henry will be with us a little bit later. We'll preview the game tonight. But Joe Mazzula, buddy, you are very young. I hope we're not all going to be dead soon, as Joe Mazzula said in that press conference there. Uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe like this 80-year-old coach or something like that. Joe, come on, man. The players are young. You're young. Let's not go there. Not yet. All right. Uh, Dallas Cowboys certainly up against it. They've been questioned. Uh, a lot of negativity surrounding their season. Mike McCarthy was asked how different the coaching is moving away from the computers and in person. And I think the biggest thing that's come out of this, just, you know, once again, we met as a staff this morning at seven and is we need to spend more time in group settings. You know, we, our coaches do a really good job because, um, you know, 10 years ago, I, I felt that there was a there was an epidemic of PowerPoint coaching and, and we really spend a ton of time of making sure our players see a tremendous amount of video in the structured meeting time uh, together. So we, we need to you know build off of that and make sure that we do that. Not more in, in the individual. Where I'm, where I'm going with this is we got we got to get away from as many individual meetings. We need more group because our connection between position needs to be higher. Uh, you can you can talk about details and buzzword the hell out of these conversations, but the reality of it is that the, if the connection uh, between the positions uh, doesn't increase, then the unit production is not going to be where we want it to be. So that's that's really, you know, going through with a fine tooth. We, you know, it's you still only have the same amount of work days. You still only have the same amount of work hours. But you know, it's the specifics of how can we be better. And you know, that that's probably one of the biggest adjustments we'll make as far as our training regiment. We'll see if it works for the Dallas Cowboys. Matthew Waters from Legal Sports Report is up next.
Guardians, despite being at home in the land, were a home underdog against Derek Skubal. Enter Lane Thomas, maybe one of the under-the-radar trade deadline acquisitions being dealt from the Nationals. He was huge in the ALDS. A heavy favorite for the New York Yankees in the series. You're going to look to their best two ball players to be those MVPs. That's Juan Soto and it's Aaron Judge. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Right here with you on Pro Football Today on Sports Grid. Odds in motion, trying to see what lines have moved throughout the week. Never felt more comfortable in the set than I do for this year. I'm uh, ready. I'm just getting angry. The hot takes are going to be here all uh, long, people. What? in the world is going on in Miami, dog. It's not particularly anything to shy away from just because many people are on top of it. Hot take, hot take. I think this line is asking you once again to take the Orleans. Pro Football Today, only on Sports Grid. Back to Newswire here on Sports Grid, as we have Matthew Waters with us from Legal Sports Report. And, you know, certainly there's a, a very big change that's already occurred for those of you who still view uh, cable and have these regional sports networks. If those of you are not familiar and you haven't turned into or tuned into, excuse me, Bally Sports, it's no longer that. It's now called FanDuel Sports Network. So let's bring in Matthew Waters from Legal Sports Report. And, uh, you know, Matt, a a lot of this is, uh, you know, the diamond bankruptcy case that they're trying to pull themselves out of. It seems like they've gotten at least a Band-Aid now uh, or some duct tape. (laughs) I don't know what you would call it, uh, you know, to hang on here. Uh, But the great news is that FanDuel has stepped up and has decided to basically uh, keep the ball rolling, so to speak. In fact, anywhere you tune into any of your regional sports networks that were named Bally are now FanDuel. So I was wondering what you thought of this new agreement. You know, Craig, what I think of the agreement is I I think FanDuel is going to do what Bally's always hoped they could do with these regional sports networks and is just grow their brand even more. Look, when I saw this deal change and I was on social media, people didn't realize that Bally's was even still a sports betting brand, Craig. They said, you know, oh yeah, I know there's a Bally's casino or there's this and that. But a lot of people didn't even know that Bally Bet was a sports book that you could choose to bet with. And that just shows you, you know, what Bally's did with their interactive plan there. And they've made so many changes. But now you have FanDuel coming in, and FanDuel is already a household name, right? So this really is just an extra boost for them. Uh, They already have such a wide appeal across the U.S. that, you know, it's hard to think of making DraftKings and FanDuel even more of a a household name than it already is. But certainly that's what this accomplishes for FanDuel. Um, I was interested to see that shareholders – didn't the the stock didn't pop more on this news, Craig? And I, I was surprised by that because, you know, FanDuel and Flutter, their parent company right now, they have said that they will continue to acquire customers as long as it makes sense for them financially. And just about every operator with their second quarter earnings calls uh, over the summer, they said that yes, it is getting cheaper to acquire customers. So now FanDuel adds in this other funnel that wasn't even there before now it's Mm -hmm. not getting cheaper because they're being more efficient with their national marketing or they're more efficient with their promos or whatever it may be now it's cheaper just because it's a logo on the bottom of a screen somewhere that somebody's watching and then they think oh let me let me fire up FanDuel let me see what's going on there so I think it's a great move for FanDuel um you know especially when you think about how do FanDuel and DraftKings how do they edge out each other? How do, you know, if you're not a fan of either one right now, 
what is really the difference between the two? Um, and I, I think this shows that FanDuel is just, it's just a bigger company in general, the Flutter company with the FanDuel brand. It's just a bigger, more diverse company than DraftKings. I, I think that's what you see with with a deal like this. So it's um, it's a shame for Bally's. It's a shame it never worked out because on paper, it sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Have your brand on this. Have people get more familiar with it. You know, you don't really have to do a whole lot of marketing at that point. You know, in effect, you think it should kind of work on its own and uh, didn't for Bally's, but we'll see how much it moves the needle for FanDuel. Yeah, and definitely a ton uh, more credibility now, I, I think, for these regional sports networks, too. Having FanDuel, it's, you know, the premier sports you know, betting company along with DraftKings in the country. So I, I think good job by both parties here getting that done. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, ESPN Bet, I mean, certainly they're hoping that their brand, you know, just lands people into their sports betting operator. We have you know talked about this a ton of time. They're having so many now primetime games on uh, college football and, and Monday night football as well. Do you think there's any correlation here potentially to making this work? Craig, I don't know. I, I've been bringing these monthly numbers to you for a while now, talking about how well ESPN is doing on the digital side of things and on social and even on linear media. They broke all kinds of records. This is <clears throat> a press release, excuse me, talking about their fiscal year. And uh, listen to some of this. Their social media reach 8.5 billion social engagements, which was 50% more than its next closest competitor. Its digital and social reach, they call it massive. Between ESPN Digital and ESPN Social, they combined to reach 66% of the United States adult population and 82% of adults in the key 18 to 49 demographic. That's key for sports um, television and that's a key demo for sports betting as well uh craig these numbers are so incredible that you sit there wondering how espn bet can debut in new york with less than a two percent handle share <clears throat> it just simply doesn't make sense to me when i see just how well espn is doing on the media side of things and how that gap just does not seem to be getting any closer to closed when you move over to sports betting, um, I, I'm not sure what else it will take at this point, Craig, if I'm being totally honest with you. And if you remember, yeah. we talked about the investor meeting that they had in Las Vegas, and it seemed like they were moving the goalpost a little bit. You know, they had talked about one of their presentations had talked about market share up to 20 percent for sports betting. And then we saw in this most recent presentation, well, the the bull case was actually 10 percent. So. Uh, you have to wonder what's going on at ESPN. They've had layoffs at, at ESPN Bet in the interactive division. Um, certainly that is not great to see when the product itself isn't delivering. So there are a lot of unanswered questions <clears throat> for ESPN Bet right now. Good news is, Craig, is that we get some of them answered on November 7th. That's the sure. third quarter earnings call date for Penn. And look, pen management is going to have to come in and kind of um, explain what's going on here if they don't have some good results to show. You know, they were able to curb their losses a little bit. They had some huge losses to start the year in Interactive. Seems like they figured that out. And they are improving with the product a little bit, and they're getting good playthrough. But it still just does not seem to reflect the amount of share they should get organically just from being ESPN bet. Um, yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that call in a couple weeks to see what they have to say. All right. Well, uh, finally, uh, Caesar Sportsbook, again, as soon as betting uh, was legalized, they jumped in right away. I, I see they have this new online game, Caesar's uh, Empire. Tell us more about this new game that people could play. You know, Craig, what the game does isn't even really that important for our purposes when we talk about the fact that Caesars is leaning heavily so much into iGaming, and that's one of the things that's making it cheaper to get these sports betting customers, too. They start off at casino, you throw them a bone, a free, uh, excuse me, a bonus bet or two over on the sports book, and then they're, they're in your, your sports book database at that point. The fact that they partnered with IGT to create uh, a branded game <clears throat> with a lot of features that are popular, Craig, it has the popular locket feature when it's on a jackpot. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the, the bonus game, um, 
mode, you know, it'll lock certain features and payouts and bonuses. Um, that's something that a lot of people like that's going to drive traffic, honestly. And remember, we had this conversation over the summer where when BetMGM and Caesars get their product to a point where it's almost comparable with FanDuel and DraftKings, we might have a, a, a tussle for who is going to be at the top because BetMGM and FanDuel, or uh, excuse me, BetMGM and Caesars, they have such strong rewards programs and loyalty programs built through their casino. So this is a great move for Caesars to be taking iGaming as seriously as it is. And I, I think it only brings in more customers for them. Yeah, it does. All right, uh, Matt, by the way, your Sixers just announced that uh, Joel Embiid and Paul George out tomorrow night for uh, opening uh, night for the Sixers. So, you know, there's other things on TV, Matt. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good Thanks, Craig. Yeah. Long you and Joe Pizzola really ruined my day, man. <laughs> Joe Pizzola. Weird guy. All right, Matt. Thanks again. <laughs> Thank you, Dexter sir. Dexter Henry's care. up next to preview the NBA game. Despite being at home in the land, we're a home underdog against Tarek Skubal. Enter Lane Thomas, maybe one of the under-the-radar trade deadline acquisitions being dealt from the Nationals. He was huge in the ALDS. A heavy favorite for the New York Yankees in the series. You're going to look to their best two ball players to be those MVPs. That's Juan Soto and it's Aaron Judge. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Right here with you on Pro Football Today on Sports Grid. Odds in motion, trying to see what lines have moved throughout the week. Never felt more comfortable in the set than I do for this year. I'm uh, ready. I'm just getting angry. The hot takes are going to be here all uh, week long. What in the world is going on in Miami, Dom? It's not particularly anything to shy away from just because many people are on top of it. Hot takes, hot takes. I think this line is asking you once again to take the Orleans. Pro Football Today, only on Sports Grid. Welcome back to Newswire opening night in the NBA. The defending champs play. Also, is there a chance the father and son combo make their debut tonight? Let's check in with Dexter Henry, of course, of the Post and Sportsnet New York. They got Dexter running around uh, covering all sports, Giants, Jets, Yankees, oh, Knicks, yeah. maybe throw in Brooklyn. I don't know. Uh, Dexter, <laughs> thanks again for making a few minutes from me here on the show. How are you? I'm good, Craig. Good to see you. Hope all is well with you, too. And uh, you're right. It has been a very, very busy time in New York sports for sure. Yeah, it is. And a great time too. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen tonight. I know that the Celtics are going to raise the rafters as they say tonight in the NBA, they're five and a half point favorites against the New York Knicks as they open up the season. Now, if history tells me anything about the past now, Dexter, I don't have the data in front of me, but just from like remembering the past, it always seems like slow starts happen for the defending champs always in that first game. I don't know why that is, but it always seems that way. 
Is that the case, you think, tonight for the Celtics? Total, by the way, 222 and a half. Knicks with some injuries, too, up against it. Yeah, I do think that is the case, Craig. And it's not, it's, it is true. Like, you're remembering correctly here. The opening night is always tough for the team with the defending champions as they raise their banner to the Raptors. They get their rings. That whole ceremony, that makes everything longer from pregame, the halftime ceremony. Everything is longer. So I think players being creatures of habit, they're thrown off whack a little bit with it. And that's why I love for this matchup looking at that total. You know, you said the over under there is 222 and a half. I would definitely bang the under there. Number, a couple of reasons, right? One is that slow start that you have with these teams. And the other thing is the Knicks and the Celtics last year, two of the slowest paced teams in the NBA. These are two, should be two of the better defensive teams in the NBA. And they have two of the best wing defenders on each of these teams. So I love the under here. I would go with the under. I could see this being a much lower scoring game. And I think, you know, generally at this time of the year, defense for a lot of the good defensive teams is ahead of the offense. I can see these offensive struggling just a little bit. So I like that under of 222 and a half for Nick Celtics tonight. All right. Good call there. Fair, fair from Dexter on that one, by the way, in the East, very strange that not that we would see a favorite, but that the sports books. And in this case, FanDuel has basically told us that it's a four team race this early on in the season. Generally, you get a lot more uh, teams that are eight to one, nine to one, but Dexter, we're not seeing this beyond the Celtics. It's the Knicks, the Sixers and the Bucks. And, and if anybody else was to come out of the East, wh- wow, what kind of money could you make on uh, Orlando or Miami or someone else with longer, much longer odds there? Do you feel that it is a four-team race to the end? By the way, Philly going to be without a couple of their stars to start the season, too. I, I will say I think it's a three-team race. And I'm glad you mentioned Philly being without a couple of their stars. And we know that Joel Embiid says he probably won't play in back-to-backs for the foreseeable future. Milwaukee's the team that I'm unsure about, right? And I think that you could see another team leapfrog here. Don't be surprised if I would say the Pacers, who I think people might be undervaluing a little bit, and also Cleveland. I'm not saying they could win the championship, but could they make another run to the conference finals? Could they definitely get themselves in the semifinals conversation when it comes to the playoffs? I think, yes. Can they get themselves a top four seed? I would also say yes. I just think there's a lot of questions marks for me with Milwaukee with their age, Injury history with Chris Middleton. How does year two of Dame and Giannis look? Those are all questions for me. But I think what you're seeing and why these numbers are reflected by Vegas, Craig, is the fact that there's so much parity in the NBA right now. When you look at the amount of teams that could finish between 50 and just 45 wins, we saw so many of those teams last year. So I think you could see something similar to that. But I do think the Knicks, Celtics, and I would say Sixers, if healthy, which is a huge key, I think right. they're the three best teams in the East for sure. Yeah, and nobody's winning the championship in the NBA in October or November. We've learned that a long time right. ago. So, uh, all right, so tonight, I, I guess the biggest question is, will we see this huge historical moment? I got to tell you, um, you know, I, I saw Ken Griffey uh, Jr. and Sr. are going tonight because, again, if Bronny does get in the game with LeBron, it'll be the first time in the history of the NBA, the two uh, you know, father and son will play at the same time. Not as much buzz, though, going into tonight as there was when all this happened, which makes me think maybe Bronny is just not going to play tonight. I'm not really sure. Uh, Timberwolves minus a point and a half at L.A., total of 219 and a half. We know Minnesota at the end of the season is probably going to have a better regular season record than the Lakers. Are the Lakers motivated, you think, Dexter, to do anything in these first couple of months? They have shown no motivation in the last couple of years. Yeah, I think they are, but I think a lot of it is, I'll say, vibes, right? Because it's all about J.J. Redick being here now. They've got a new coach. I think they're motivated to see what they can do with this new coach and how that can work. But if you're the Lakers, you really have to look at this Laker team and say, okay, yeah, I love LeBron James still, but he is 40 years old. Father time might be coming for him at some point. Anthony Davis as well, too. Those two guys had some of their most recent healthiest seasons. So... I don't know how this all plays out for them and what the depth is on the roster beyond that. So, I yes, I think there'll be a little bit of juice for the Lakers. I think they'll be motivated to play well for J.J. Redick coming off of Darvin Ham. But do I see the Lakers as a serious contender, Craig? Nah, I don't. But I could see them coming out and playing well. And I think the line reflects that tonight is this is pretty much a pick and game. Minnesota favored by one. But I, I think they will play well. But... I like Minnesota here with more of the continuity, even though they've made some changes. I just think Minnesota knows more of who they are right now than the Lakers do. All right, let's wrap up with the Western Conference odds. These are the odds to win the West. 
and a lot different than the East. You have several teams bunched up here, no clear favorite. OKC three to one, Minnesota, who plays tonight five to one. Denver is going to be right in the thick of it to the end, five to one. Uh, Dallas was the darling early on in the season last year. That faded uh, at plus 550. Um, Phoenix, plus 950. I'm not sure on that one why they would be such a favorite. Maybe I'm missing something there. Is it one of these four, uh, five teams, Dexter? I love OKC and the value you can get on them early on at three to one odds. I love them there. I also wouldn't sleep on Denver. You know, the thing about Denver is there are question marks. And I think there's a reason they're five to one is a lot of people do not know what is going to happen in terms of their role players. They lost KCP. Now they have guys they are asking to step up. Christian Brown, Julian Strother. Can those guys step up from them? But when you have the best player in the NBA, which is Nikola Jokic, I don't think it's a bad bet to take him at five to one and see how things progress throughout the season. All right. Great stuff, Dexter. Enjoy the games tonight and uh, then enjoy the World Series, which, of course, begins out in L.A. on Friday night. Thanks again for coming on. Will do. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate you, man. All right, Dexter Henry. Catch him over in the post and also on Sportsnet New York. We'll be back with more Last Licks getting into uh, Shohei Otani's 50-50 ball. About to sell. I'll tell you what, next. Despite being at home in the land, we're a home underdog against Derek Skubal. Enter Lane Thomas, maybe one of the under-the-radar trade deadline acquisitions being dealt from the Nationals. He was huge in the ALDS. A heavy favorite for the New York Yankees in the series. You're going to look to their best two ball players to be those MVPs. That's Juan Soto and it's Aaron Judge. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Right here with you on Pro Football Today on Sports Grid. Odds in motion, trying to see what lines have moved throughout the week. Never felt more comfortable in the set than I do for this year. I am uh, ready. I'm just getting angry. The hot takes are going to be here all uh, long. People. What in the world is going on in Miami, Doc? It's not particularly anything to shy away from just because many people are on top of it. Hot takes, hot takes. I think this line is asking you once again to take the wounds. Pro Football Today, only on Sports Grid. Welcome back to Newswire here on Sports Grid. Time to wrap things up. We'll have a little bit of a World Series themed preview here at the end, and and also really interesting statistical analysis by the National Basketball Association that may change stats in the future. I'll get into it all. It's time now for some last licks. Well, uh, look, this has been going on in the NBA for many years, okay? You, you work with me here. Think about this, okay? Time is ticking down in the first half, not the second half of games, you know, although it does happen. But let, let, let's focus on the first half of games. There's three seconds left there on the clock. Uh, you know, player comes out of bounds. The only shot he has is to just heave it up and try to make that full or, you know, even more than half-court shot, right? And what would you say? Uh, uh, 75 out of 80 times, is that fair? 77 out of 80 times, it doesn't go in, right? 
So in the G League, what they're doing, very interesting, is they're experimenting with the idea of not counting that against the player's stats, meaning that it's, the fr- it's like a free heave, I guess, what you would say, is at the end of the half and at the end of the game, too, if I'm not mistaken. But again, at the end of the game, it's important because sometimes the, the shot may actually count. So I guess that really is the question, is what if it goes in? Uh, does it count? <laughs> does it count with the stats? And is it only if it's not? So here's what's happening. They're not using this, folks, in the NBA. I want to be perfectly clear. What they're doing is they're experimenting with it in the G League this year, and then they'll decide whether or not to incorporate it in the NBA. But so many times that highlight of the player actually making it is a really cool thing. But you would probably say more often than not, in fact, like 90% of the time, I'm guessing it does not go in even more than that. So we'll see if they make that adjustment in the NBA in the future. Not going to be this year, just in the G League. Okay, tonight is a big night for that guy who caught Shohei Otani's uh, 50-50 ball. Remember that back in Miami, back when, boy, it feels like a long time ago. It was back uh, about a month ago in September. He uh, gave the ball to auction off to Golden Auction, and the auction ends for some reason tonight, interestingly enough, here uh, on this Tuesday night. And as of right now, folks, there were some people that thought that the ball would go for a a million dollars. The bidding is already, folks, at two million dollars in fact there are some estimations that this could go between three and five million which would be the highest baseball bid of all time so uh someone's going to become really rich tonight folks now again after fees and some taxes and things like that you're going to lose about a million bucks right but in the end just imagine being at a game catching a ball and not only your life but your entire family's life has changed as well that's why these stories get so much run, and that's why we talk about them here on Newswire 2. So we'll see what happens tonight. We'll report back tomorrow on the final auction value. Meanwhile, Taylor Trammell, former big prospect in Major League Baseball, not so much anymore. He's bounced around the league, a bunch of different teams, Seattle, Tampa Bay. Uh, did you know that he played on both the Yankees and Dodgers this season? I did not. He played on five games each total with the Yankees and Dodgers. So guess what happens? When the World Series champion is crowned, a share of the playoff money is going to go to Taylor Trammell. Now, here is what's interesting about this is that if I'm not mistaken, the way that this used to work, and I think it still does, is the players who win the championship on the current 26-man roster vote how much share to give all the players that played previously for the team. So, honestly... Uh, Trammell, in all likelihood, unless the Yankees and Dodgers are super generous, is probably not going to earn a full playoff share, which is a lot of money, by the way, for winning the World Series. But either way, he's cashing in. So here's the question. Who is this guy rooting for? Did anybody interview him? Uh, Because I haven't seen it. Uh, But he's getting money. He's getting paid regardless. Exactly five games for each. Did he have a bigger impact for either? I don't think so. So congrats to Taylor Trammell. You win, even if you lose. Great stuff. All right, uh, that'll do it for the show today. Thanks again to Dexter Henry for coming on the program, previewing some NBA. Also, thanks to Matthew Waters from Legal Sports Report. And also thanks to Bill Bender from Sporting News. In addition, uh, our great director, Luke, and our great producer, Frank, those were the people in charge of our show today. As always, I'll be right back with you here tomorrow for next edition of Newswire, 11 a.m. Eastern. But folks, do not go anywhere because the early line is coming up next. And guess what? You'll get to see me previewing the World Series. I gave out a couple of free props. Make sure you check those out uh, over with uh, Ben. I was on with Ben earlier today. Then Scott Farrell is on Coast to Coast. 3 o'clock Eastern, followed by Game Time Decisions, In-Game Live Game Day, and Sports Rage tonight. No question, guess what the focus is going to be tonight? It's the two games opening night in the National Basketball Association. All the betting, all the information, all the odds, everything you can ask for exclusively right here on Sports Grid. I'll recap it all for you tomorrow morning with our next edition of Newswire at 11 a.m. Eastern. Have a great rest of your Tuesday night, everyone. See you then.